five years ago you voted, maybe not five years ago, 10 years ago when you voted, you're voting Democrat versus Republican, and Republicans had the reputation of pro-war party and all this other stuff. And for the longest time, that's what the case was. Totally. And then gradually, 2016, 2015, things changed. And then all of a sudden, you started noticing this isn't about Democrat against Republican. It never got this public. Remember, totally. social media is one of the best things that ever happened because it exposes everybody. I mean, a guy like you, you take social media out, you're not going to be on the debate stage. They wouldn't oh, give it to that. you because you're yeah. not. So social media became the great equalizer for a guy like you to come out and call these guys out. Today is the ultimate establishment versus the anti-establishment vote. So on December 6th, we're doing the town hall with RFK. What are your thoughts with RFK? RFK, uh, if you want to pull this up, Rops, you know, on, on yesterday, tired of Biden and Trump, 10% of sw swing state, voters are back in RFK. He was watching a debate, and he actually liked some of the things that you said. I don't know if you saw when he was uh, I didn't commenting. I see that, no. Yeah, so what are your thoughts about him, and who does he hurt? What does this say about today's election? Is he a modern-day Ross Pro, or is this a, is a complete different case study of an independent uh, candidate? So I, I like I like his spirit. I like a lot of his – the spirit I like is the willingness to challenge the establishment in what was his own party. I think his commitment to speaking about topics that the Democratic Party doesn't want him speaking about. And I think of all of the other candidates – I mean I, I don't think he has – offered the clarity of exact foreign policy that that I have, if I may say so, but or and I, and I don't know that he's in the details on this stuff, but his instincts are at least understanding that World War III is a really bad option to the United States. So I appreciate those things about him. We have some policy disagreements, and th those are less important than what I'm about to say. I mean, he has in the past, I think, said things like, and maybe he doesn't mean, mean it anymore, but he has said things like, people who spread climate disinformation should be put in jail. I, look, <laughs> I think the whole climate change agenda is a hoax. We can have that discussion, and let alone, even if you d didn't agree with that, the answer to speech you disagree with is not censorship. And, and on a good day, RFK knows that too. You know, he, he believes in affirmative action and racial reparations. I'm against a lot of that. I think it's divisive. It's toxic. So we have, we have our plenty of shared policy agreements, but at least I, I think his heart is in the right place. And he's somebody who is unafraid to challenge orthodoxies, and I respect that about him. I just wish he wasn't so scared of me. <laughs> Why do you think he's scared of you? Oh, I mean, the number of networks. I mean, you should – I don't know if the dates work out. You could actually offer him the same thing. I mean, I can't tell you the number of – podcasts, networks, et cetera, that have said, hey, would you have an open discussion with RFK? And I said, absolutely, I would do it. <laughs> and every time he backs out of it, and I think that, I, look, I think that if somebody sees the way that I'm going after other Republican candidates on the debate stage, I actually would not, that would not be my treatment of RFK. I think we would have, in a different format, more of a conversation like you and I are having. And so I think that he, I, I don't, I mean, I, I could understand why if somebody's building their brand, they don't want the anti-establishment sheen to wear off if you're getting, you know, called out. But I would my goal wouldn't be to call him out on this stuff. We have some disagreements, but let's have actually – I think he's probably the one person in American politics – and I actually put in some sense Donald Trump in this category too, but that's about it – who you can actually end up having a conversation that's unscripted. And you could actually be much more mutually respectful about your disagreements. And so, you know, I, I'd, I'd pledge to say that if, if he, you know, uh, manned up and, and agreed to one of those things, I would – my goal would not be to play gotcha with him. I mean, here's, here's just a fact of the matter is that different people are different leaders of different styles, right? I can't speak for him, but he's not in the details, right, in terms of domestic policy or foreign policy or the how – I'm a CEO by nature. I, I, you know, enjoy writing, reading these books and things like this. And so I am a details guy, but my goal will not be to the extent that part of his concern would be because I'm in the details, play gotcha games with him. That's not, that wouldn't be the point. The point would be to actually have a conversation that advances true discourse in the country in a way that challenges a bipartisan establishment that's by and large, equally corrupt. And I think he gets that, and I respect him for that. But I think that, you know, if he's running to be president, and this man wants to, and I don't, I don't think he thinks or anyone thinks he's going to, I don't think he believes he's in this to win. I think he believes in this to move the conversation. But if he's running for president, and you want to sit across the table from Xi Jinping, and you're an advocate for free speech, you know, I, 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 haven't, I'm not, I haven't been the one 
you know, I mean, it's been networks that have repeatedly been pounding both of us. Every time I say yes, and every time it's, oh, he didn't want to do it. And I think that that's a little bit unbecoming of him because this is a guy, I love the fact that he's fearless. Go all the way with being fearless. And that's what I would say. And so maybe he will. And so I want to give him give him room for that. But that's all I would say is the I'm one sure disappointment. See He'll see this. Yeah, Who do you think he is? He's a good or? dude. He's a yeah. good dude. He, and, and he's, he, he, and you know, we have our disagreements, but if my only advice to him would be, if you're going to be a free speech guy, go free speech all the way. Don't do this climate change misinformation censorship garbage. This is if you want to practice credit. free speech. Give credit yeah, where credit is due. Vivek uh, makes some good points on Ukraine. Glad to see some of his some of the over awareness of the Republican Party. Who do you think he helps or hurts? That's a little bit of an. <laughs> It's a little bit of a light touch understatement there, because I think I think the good points on Ukraine is we got to go deep into the details, and it's not just mm -hmm. on Ukraine, but broader foreign policy. But he's he's a thoughtful guy, and so I think a lot of good would come out of an open conversation. But I just think if you're running for U.S. president, this applies to me, applies to everybody. Hold me to the standard. Call me out if I'm not doing this at some point too, right? And I get it because. Like my sense is, if you look at people who are running his campaign, you got a lot of swamp creatures from prior Democratic establishment campaigns. And I have, you know, I, I, I get this. If you're surrounded by an establishment that can still shave off a little bit of the edge, I'd say bring back the inner you and let's actually lay it out on the table. And so, yeah, if you talk to him, I would just, my, my encouraging, the thing I would do, and I've talked to him a couple times this campaign, I think that, you know, he's he's doing a lot of important things. You guys but, have spoken? Yeah, we've spoken a few okay. times. Yeah. Yeah. And I told him the same thing when I talked to him too is practice what you preach when it comes to free speech. And free speech is about a culture and an example that you set for the country. You know, Barry Goldwater, I think, um, was it him and, and JFK, whoever it was, yeah, I mean, they would talked about potentially flying around the country on the same plane, you know, do do Lincoln Douglas style debates. I mean, that doesn't happen in this country anymore. And I think there's an opportunity to set a good example. But you got to man up, and there's some risk involved in every conversation you have. But you got to take that on in a way that advances the interests of the country. And if you want to sit across the table from Xi Jinping or whoever else, and you got to show the people you're fit enough to sit across the table from somebody who has different opinions than you and may have different knowledge base than you. And that's a good thing if both people are approaching it. A good I think thing. if there's a leader's bulletin and who has uh, agreed to face off anybody the most, anybody, opposing, supporting, anybody, you're number one, okay, in that. I think number two would be RFK, and then it's just everybody else is going to become, I give DeSantis credit for being here. Haley didn't want to be here. We invited Nikki Haley. She didn't want to come and talk on a podcast and do a long form. I don't know if she's done any long form. Uh, podcasts herself. It's all going to be pre-vetted, pre-scripted. You know, I'm sure there'll be a lot of rules. You have to send the questions in advance. Sort of and by the yeah. way, to give credit to DeSantis, nothing good, was off good. table. They they just said, I, "Hey, I ask give, the questions." I do and, give credit, because yeah. especially for a guy like him, where he's not naturally comfortable doing that, or at least wasn't. You know, I, you got to give credit where credit's due. I agree with that. So if you like this clip and you want to watch another one, click right here. And if you want to watch the entire podcast, click right here.